Hello, class. I hope you had a great uh, core group discussion on Jesus's high priestly prayer. So let's start off with prayer. Father, we thank you for everything you have given us. We thank you that we get to see the glory of you, Lord, in our lives, because that's what you have ordained. We thank you for this prayer, a demonstration of how you not only hear our prayers, but you answer them. And we pray, Lord, even now, 2,000 years after Jesus went back to the, to the throne, that we can be obedient to what he called us to do, and we'll continue to glorify his name. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. So I'm going to put up my outline right away. So I won't forget. The son prays to the father. This week's lesson is really uh, Jesus prays for three things. He prays for himself, for his disciples, and all believers who come after the disciples. He prays for us today, 2,000 years later, because we are part of my third outline there. Jesus is demonstrating to all of us what it means what he meant in John 15, 7, where he said, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He's praying this to the Father in the Father's name. And he and the Father are one. And God is supernaturally answering this prayer. This is a model for all of us. This prayer reveals reveals the heart of Jesus and the heart of the Father. That is, they live in perfect unity, and they want us to live in, in that same unity. They want to make us one with Jesus as Jesus is one with the Father, so we are one in their essence and being. God's, this is God's heart for us, and we are to be obedient to it, because when we are obedient to it, people will see the glory of God. When we are one with the Lord and with each other, the world will see the glory of God. So let's start off with Jesus prays for himself. He just got finished giving the final instructions to the disciples. He takes the a very common Jewish position of raising his hands, looking up to heaven and praying to the Father. And here's what he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom, to all whom you have given him. And what is this eternal life? This eternal life is, he defines it, this eternal life, that they may know you, the one and only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to know? To know is not just to know that Jesus is the Messiah or know God. It's to know. It's an intimate know. It's a, you know him so well that when something comes up, you know how he's going to think because you have an intimate relationship. Marsha and I are, are going to be married for 50 years. I know how she's going to react to something. There's an intimacy, a knowledge there. That's what they're talking about. And to know doesn't only mean for eternal life when we get to heaven. What it means is for right now. We know the heart of the Messiah. When we walk in his footsteps and life comes at us fast, we know what the Lord, how the Lord is going to react because we have an intimate relationship with him. Now Jesus' work is completed and he has to go back to the Father. And he prays this out to the Father. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had before the world ex existed. That glory 
is unbelievable. It's a glory that's so glorified that we can't even look at it. In Exodus 34, Moses asked God to give, uh, to let him see his glory. And God told him he couldn't see his full glory, but he'd show him part of it. What happened when he showed him? He saw the glory of God when he came down from the mountain. And when he started talking to the Israelites, they saw something different. They saw a glory over him. They knew he was in the presence of God. You know something? That's the same glory we have. When we are one with the Lord, when we are unified with him, we receive that glory like Moses, and the people will recognize it. Give you an example, and I think it's important. Tom Doyle wrote three books on dreams and visions and, and reaching out and how God is reaching Muslim people. And one of my favorite characters in Killing Christians, uh, that's his second book, was Aziz Azam Mubarak. He was a pirate. Son of the lead pirate, the oldest son of the lead pirate, Somali pirates, and they were Muslim. And God came to Aziz in a dream, and he started revealing himself. And Aziz's mother helped him along because she also was a secret Christian. So she helped him along. And then she told him he had to flee because he really believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So he fled to another town. His father found out about it. He had two of his men kill his mother and then cut her up, cut her up in pieces, put her in a box and sent him special delivery to where uh, he had fled to. Aziz opened it up and you can see the horror, feel the horror, horror that he felt when he saw his mother. Few nights later, he was walking the street on his way to uh, a secret church meeting, and he came face to face with the two guys who did that. Remember, he was a pirate, and they are pirates. They reached their hand in their cloak to pull out their knives because they saw Aziz and they knew what he could do. And he looked at them and he said, don't pull out your knives. I know what you did, and I forgive you. I know what you meant for harm. God meant for good. And you know what they did? They put it back in because when they looked at him, they saw the glory of God on him, much like Moses did in chapter 34. And those two guys ended up becoming followers of Jesus because of that glory, because of Aziz was one with the Father. That's what the power of that unity is. When we are one with the Lord and with each other, the world will see the glory of God. Will you pray to the Father for this type of intimacy, this type of knowledge, so that when you walk, the world will see the glory of God? Now Jesus prays for his disciples. He has fully revealed himself to them, and he had revealed God's name to them. So they understood that everything Jesus was telling them came from God. It wasn't Jesus making this up. He actually received it from God. And what did they uh, take away from that? That everything that the Torah said, the Hebrew scripture said, from the prophets to the Psalms to the writings, pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. He was a fulfillment of what Isaiah said in Isaiah 7, 9, 11, Isaiah 53. I could go on and on, but they received that and they believed it. And now Jesus was praying for them. He prayed to the Father not to take them out of the world, but that he would protect them. As Jesus's name, or as God's name, would protect them. That's what, how he, he said it. He said that maybe, and that he wanted them to be one, even as they were one. 
the power of Jesus's name, the power of God's name, excuse me. And what is that power? It's when they say that in the Hebrew, it's the essence of God. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord who heals. He is God Almighty. He is the God who sees all, knows all, and hears all. He asked God to protect them. And then he asked them to make them one. As I previously said, it's important to understand God's heart for us to be one, to be in unity. The creedal statement for Judaism is, is Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That Echad, which is one, is a complex unity. It's, we're one, but it's just not the number one. It's a complex unity. It's all the facets of our life. It's where we get the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's how God can say he's one God, yet he has three distinctions of what he's doing. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's a complex unity. When, we, when I got married, if you look at the marriage writings in Genesis uh, 1, it said, and, the, and the, the man and the woman shall become echad, one. That doesn't mean Marsh and I are the same. We're unified as one. We're in unity with each other. David wrote about this in the Psalm of Ascents. Now, Psalm of Ascents were psalms that that the people would pray as they were going up to Jerusalem three times a year, Jewish men had to go up to Jerusalem. And this is what they would pray. One of the Psalms, there's uh, uh, 13 or 14 of them. And he said, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Why is that important? Because they were going up to Jerusalem, and that town was going to swell close to a million people. They're all Jews, but he's praying for unity. Some came from the Galilee, some came from the diaspora, some came from southern uh, Israel, some lived there. And they all had different ways, but they were unified in one thing, that they were called by God's name that they were one in the Lord and was important for them. Because here's how the Psalm keeps going. It's like the precious oil uh, coming down on the beard of Aaron, down on his, on his clothes to the edges of it. That's a sign of the Holy Spirit. It's like the dew of Hermon. That's a Northern mountain, the mountain where transfiguration was. It, this dew flows into the Sea of Galilee which goes into the Jordan River, and it waters and gives life. And it's like the dew of Hermon coming down, Hermon coming down on the mountains of Zion. And here's what it says. For the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Unity brings life. It shines glory on God. Unity, being one with the Lord and with each other is very important to the Lord because he knows the world is attracted by this type of love and unity for the oneness of God. Let me tell you a quick story how this, uh, how this makes sense. In September of 1986, I, with a bunch of other Messianic Jews, wanted to do an outreach into the Jewish community. So we had sent ads and paper in the Jewish papers. We hit all the hot spots in Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, Edina, where Jews live. And we invited them to come to talk and hear how Jesus was the Messiah. So that night, I mean, I'm leading this, and about four hours before we even have the thing, our main speaker backs out. So we had to find a new speaker. Well, it just so happens that there was uh, a man in town, I've heard of him, never met him, Messianic Jew, and he came, and he came and, and was speaking. Now, we did this through Good News for Israel. We did it with the Messianic 
congregation in town. There was a couple of them, but one main one. And he gets up and he gives a talk on how Messianic Judaism was outside of what God wanted for Jews who believed in Jesus. He felt they had to be one in the church. And he gave a polemic on it. And I got to tell you, it was, you could feel the tension. You could feel the breathing of fire coming out of the uh, noses of the Messianic Jews. Well, one of the guys that came there that night was my business partner. And he's a Jew who did not believe in Jesus. He used to make fun of me all the time. He used to, excuse me. He used to make fun of me all the time and for my faith. He was an agnostic, uh, an atheist. But he came that night because his wife, who is Gentile, was hot for the Lord and she wanted to come. So we invited them. So he gets, you know, I'm praying for him to come to the Lord and he's seeing smoke coming out of everyone's nose. He could feel the tension. I had no idea what to do when, when this man got done speaking. I was going to stand up because I was the MC and Marty Getz put his hand on my shoulder and said, let me do this. And he went up to the piano and he sang a song from John 17, make us one Lord. Let the people see the unity of the son with the father. Let them see the father and the Holy Spirit. Make us one like they are. And he just paraphrased what our chapter was. And I gotta tell you, the anger went out of the room. When we got done, we were at the Edina Community Center. We went back to my house. There was about 30 or 40 of us, almost all of them Messianic Jews. And Marsha had a bunch of pies. So we had pie and ice cream. And we sat there and we talked and we sang songs of praise and we got to know everyone. And my partner says, where's the tension? And he said, well, we're Jews. So we don't all agree on anything, but we agree on one thing. Jesus is the Messiah, that God sent him, that they are one. And because of that, even though we can, we can disagree with one another and passionately disagree, we are one in that and we can embrace each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It so overwhelmed him that he gave his life to Jesus because he saw the glory of God. When we are one with the Lord and with each other, the world will see the glory of God. He did see the glory of God. He gave his life to the Lord. Oneness doesn't mean we all agree. Oneness doesn't mean we can't passionately wrestle over theological things. But oneness does believe, is that we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that when we disagree and we wrestle, even passionately, we love because he first loved us. And that will send the glory to the Lord. And that will, that will cause people to see and want a piece of that. Now, we're we get to the third part that's still going on. He, Jesus, God answered the first two prayers. This third one is still going on to this day. Jesus prayed for us. Even before we were born, he prayed for us to get this message. And God answered that prayer in a dramatic way. Think about it. 120 followers of Jesus in the upper room sitting there praying, not knowing what to do. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. And from there, that 120 in one small sermon, bam, 3,000 more. Why? Because they saw the power of the Holy Spirit. They saw the power of love. See, Jesus prayed not to take us out of the world, but to keep us in the world to protect us, and also to lead us. And he told us that there would be op opposition, and the world would come against us because they do not like 
how we are. But you know something? He did that. And when we are one with each other, and we are one with the Lord, there is a unity there, a oneness that sends glory to God. Think about that. From 120 in one sermon, 3,000, and then within months after that, 5,000. And guess what? Today, there are 2.3 billion people in this world who say Jesus is the Lord. They are Christians. So that's working in them. Listen to what, what John writes. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I am them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. You know something? He left us in this world to be, to glorify him by our works. And the biggest thing that we can do is be unified with the Lord and with one another. That oneness in the Lord will send out a witness to the world. Just yesterday, I listened to a, a friend of mine, Michael Brown, and he has a sh radio show on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I know you know all about it. It's a big day, Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. And he was interviewing another personal friend of ours, Bachia Siegel. And she is a Yemenite Jew who became a believer. She lives with her husband in, uh, and her children in Israel. They're good friends of ours. And she was telling her testimony that right at the end, she told a story to Michael Brown about how God is still working, still answering that prayer that Jesus lifted up 2,000 years ago. In the south of Israel, there was a, a, a young man who had a brain tumor that was inoperable, and he was going to die. He was in a coma. His uncle, uh, I don't know if he's secular or if he was orthodox, came there, and he said, there's got to be something Hashem the Lord can do something he can do. So he looked and called the, uh, the local Hasidic, the Orthodox uh, congregations for the rabbis to come and pray for his, for his nephew. They said he, they would come the next day. The next day, day came and they didn't come. So then he's really desperate because this kid has days to live. And he looks on the internet off his phone, sees uh, a spot by some Jews who are messianic that believe in the healing power of God. So he called them up and they said, we'll be right there. They came within an hour, within an hour. They were there. They walked in a room and right away he saw something different. He saw like the people, the Israelites saw with Moses, there was a glory on them. There was a something different. He felt the presence. And they sat there and they prayed. They anointed this young man with oil. And guess what? The young man's tumor started shrinking. And day by day, it was shrinking. Within a week, it was gone. And the doctor told the, the uncle, this is a medical miracle. The man started talking with these Messianic Jews and he saw the glory of God. He saw the love they had for one another and for the Lord. It gave glory to God and he surrendered his life to Jesus and now walks with them. That story needs to get out. And that's what it is. When we are one with the Lord and with each other, the world will see the glory. There is no more powerful witness than that because that's not what the world does. When they can see people coming from different places, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, black, white, Asian, doesn't matter. They come from different ways. They look at things differently. They have different cultures, but one thing they agree on, that Jesus is the Messiah, that God sent him, and guess what? 
There is a, a glory there. There's a unification there and the world wants it. Why? Because the light is shining. So the question is, can we do what Paul says? Can we think of our, uh, not think of ourselves more highly than we ought? And as much as it is possible on our part to share peace with all people, to get along, because when we are unified in the Lord, Jesus, and with the Father, the world will see his light. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Your word is truth. You are holy and you are righteous. Lord, help us to be one with you and one with each other. Be in that perfect unity that gives glory to you and the world will see and we'll add to the numbers that have already received you as Lord and Messiah. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you, and have a good